Chapter 28, The Unraveling. Late December of 1969, over 300,000 people converged on the Altamont Motor Speedway near San Francisco, California for a massive free concert headlined by the Rolling Stones. Earlier that summer, the Free Willing Woodstock Festival had shown the world the face of the peace and love movement of America's youth. Altamont was supposed to be Woodstock West, but Altamont was a disaster and Woodstock had its own problems, but Altamont was a real disaster. Save money, the Hells Angels biker gang was, uh, was hired to be the show's security team. As the crowd grew angrier and more drunk and more stoned, uh, fights broke out, tensions rose. The angels, drunk and high themselves, armed themselves with uh, sawed off pool cues and beat concert goers who tried to come on stage. The Grateful Dead refused to play, and finally the Rolling Stones came out. The crowd's anger at that point was palpable. Fights continued near the stage. Mick Jagger, the lead singer for the Rolling Stones, stopped in the middle of playing to try to calm the crowd. Moments later, 18-year-old Meredith Hunter approached the stage and was beaten back. Angry and high on meth, Hunter brandished a pistol, charged again, and was stabbed and killed by one of the Hells Angels. His lifeless body was stomped to the ground. The Stones, unaware the man was dead, just kept playing. If the more famous Woodstock Music Festival captured the devil-may-care spirit of the 1960s youth culture, Altamont had revealed its dark side. Drugs, hard drugs, music, and youth were not just associated with peace and love, but also with anger, violence, and death. While many Americans in the 1970s continued to celebrate the political and cultural achievements of the previous uh, decade, the 60s, a more anxious conservative mood grew across the country as well. For some, the United States had not done nearly enough to promote greater social equality across the 60s. For others, uh, the nation had gone simply too far, unfairly trampling the rights of one group to promote the selfish needs of another. Onto these brewing dissatisfactions, the 1970s dumped the divisive remnants of a failed war, the country's greatest political scandal, and an intractable economic crisis. It seemed to many as if the nation was ready to come apart. Of all the liberal institutions that aroused the ire of the conservative silent majority, I'd reference in the previous chapter, in the run-up to the Nixon era, none evoked more anger at the, in the United States than the United States Supreme Court under Chief Justice Earl Warren. The Warren Court's rulings, let's put him on here, the Warren Court. Uh, their rulings on matters of race challenge traditional social patterns of both the North and the South. In their 1962 Engel versus Vital ruling, the court ruled that prayers in public schools were unconstitutional. Prayers led by public officials within that setting, individuals were free to pray silently. In Roth versus United States, the court limited the authority of local governments to curb pornography. In Gideon versus Wainwright in 1963, the court found that felony defendants were entitled to a lawyer regardless of their ability to pay for one. The court later ruled that defendant must be allowed to access a lawyer before questioning and confirm the obligation of authorities to inform a criminal suspect of his or, her, uh, his or her rights. You have the right to remain silent. By 1968, the Warren Court had become the target of Americans who felt the United States had shifted too far towards helping the poor, the dispossessed, and the criminal at the expense of the middle class. In the 1970s, feminists turned their attention to winning control over their own sexual and reproductive lives. Comprehensive bans on abortion, which had sprung up in states across the country across the 20th century, were all overturned by the Supreme Court's Roe versus Wade decision in 1973 which found that bans on abortions in the first trimester violated the constitutional right to privacy. It was in the 1970s that the two-career family gradually became a middle-class norm, where previously it had only been a lower-class necessity, and women became less dependent on husbands. By the mid-1980s, women were serving in Congress, on the Supreme Court, and running for vice president. The environmental movement, too, experienced a rebirth in the 1970s, due in part to the environmental degradation plaguing advanced industrial societies in the late 20th century. In the field of ecology, or the science of the inter uh, interrelatedness of the natural world, people like Aldo Leopold connected the problems of pollution, deforestation, and the extinction of species, the toxic waste, in powerful new ways, creating concepts like the food chain and biodiversity in the process. A new generation of environmental activists contributed to the scientific, legal, and political battles of the movement, aided by environmental problems and disasters of the era. The Cuyahoga River in Ohio occasionally burst into flames in the 1970s. And smog levels reached unhealthy levels in American cities, and oil spills like the Exxon Valdez spill near Alaska put the problem on the front page for many Americans. Rachel Carson's influential Silent Spring uh, book, meanwhile, highlighted the problem of pesticides and challenged Americans to take the big picture view of their environmental health. 
first Earth Day was celebrated in 1970. And in short order, President Nixon signed the Clean Air and Water Acts and created the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, to enforce anti-pollution standards in uh, business and among consumers. This multi-headed new left movement of change and reform and the so-called silent majority clashed repeatedly during Nixon's turbulent presidency. When Nixon invaded suspected North Vietnamese bases in Cambodia and Laos, it only fueled the anti-war protest movement on college campuses. Over the course of 10 days in 1970, six college students were killed by police in the National Guard at Kent State uh, in Ohio and at Jackson State in Mississippi. In 1971, the New York Times began publishing excerpts from a secret study of the war prepared by the Defense Department during the LBJ era, during the Lyndon Baines Johnson era. So-called Pentagon Papers had been leaked to the press and they provided evidence that the federal government and the Department of Defense had been dishonest about its actual motives for American involvement and had exaggerated the winability of the war as they perceived it. Coupled with reports of US massacres of Vietnamese uh, civilians, particularly, especially the My Lai massacre, reports of drug addiction, racism, desertion, and mutiny among American soldiers in Vietnam, nearly two thirds of Americans began to support withdrawal uh, for the Vietnam War by 1971. With the next presidential election in his sights, Nixon and his special assistant, Henry Kissinger, very famous name, uh, pushed hard for a peace agreement with the North Vietnamese and generally pursued a policy of hands-off detente, the French word. Though a temporary ceasefire was reached in the first days of 1973, the Paris Accords were weak, and by 1975, with America on the sidelines, Vietnam and Cambodia fell to brutal dictators. After 10 years of American military involvement, 57,000 Americans were dead and 300,000 more were injured. More than 1.2 Vietnamese uh, men and women had been killed and a beautiful land had been ravaged by war, leaving the people of Vietnam some of the most impoverished of the world. The United States with its own economy and fits and starts back home, had suffered a blow to its confidence and self-esteem from which it soon did not recover. American interest in influencing the direction of Middle East conflicts and third world issues and post-colonialism declined. Although it was a political scandal that would ultimately blow apart the Nixon presidency, the sudden slowdown of the, uh, the booming post-war American economy had begun under his watch. The OPEC, or the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, an organization which still exists, um, countries in the Middle East that export, us oil, or export oil, in a bit to claim power, began to use their oil both as an uh, economic tool and as a political weapon in the 1970s. In the midst of the Yom Kippur War with Israel, they stopped selling oil to nations supporting Israel, including temporarily the U.S., which produced the first real fuel shortages in America since World War II. The, the spiraling energy crises or crisis um, that, would, that would happen throughout the 1970s became a sort of natural or national preoccupation. And while Nixon talked about the need to achieve energy independence, he offered few concrete proposals for how to get there. Other new challenges to American economic dominance included the, the final recovery of Western Europe and Japan. By the early 1970s, these, these allies were providing stiff competition to American firms in the sale of cars, steel, and electronics. Though Nixon had used a number of an economic uh, tactics to stave off rising prices and economic stagnation, it was clear that the high wage, high employment industrial economy that had been a central fact of American life since the 40s was gradually giving way to a new, more balanced international free trade order. In 1971, amidst a rapidly depreciating U.S. dollar, Nixon ended the convertibility of the American dollar for a set unit of gold, triggering the Nixon shock and sending the newly unbacked dollar, American dollar, to float against other unbacked currencies, triggering, triggering an era of miserably low growth paired with high inflation, referred to as stagnation. In the run-up to Nixon's 1972 campaign against anti-war Democrat George McGovern, Nixon's effort to break into the Democratic National Committee's headquarters at the Watergate building in Washington, D.C., and its attempted cover-up permanently soured the public on the president. After uh, Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, resigned after separate criminal charges were levied against him, it quickly became clear that the popular leader of the House of Representatives, Gerald Ford, could step into the role of the presidency in a crisis. The Supreme Court and the House of Representatives took action to punish the president for his criminal involvement in the Watergate affair. Secret audio tapes that Nixon had recorded in his White House offices provided the smoking gun investigators and journalists were looking for. And so, with an impeachment movement organizing against him in the House of Representatives, President Nixon simply threw up two peace signs and resigned from the office of the presidency, flying home to California. 
In a society in which distrust of leaders and institutions of authority were already widespread, the fall of Nixon confirmed for many Americans their most cynical assumptions about the character of American public life. Speaker of the House General uh, uh, Gerald Ford assumed the presidency uh, and his brief time in office was marred by his widely unpopular presidential pardon of Richard Milhouse Nixon. The election of Jimmy Carter in 1976 brought a Democrat to the White House for the first time since early 1969. Large Democratic majorities in Congress provided the new president with an opportunity to move aggressively on the legislative front beginning in 1976. With the infighting of the early 1970s behind them, many Democrats hoped the Carter administration would update and expand on FDR's New Deal. But Carter won the presidency on a wave of post-Watergate disillusionment with government that did not translate into support for liberal ideas. In his State of the Union address, Carter lectured Americans that government cannot solve our problems, it cannot eliminate poverty, or provide a bountiful economy, or reduce inflation, or save our cities, or cure literacy, or provide energy. The statement, that statement, neatly captured the ideological transformation of the country. Rather than leading a resurgence of American liberalism, Carter became, as one historian put it, the first president to govern in a post-New Deal framework. Carter seemed constantly under fire during his presidency, his one-term presidency, both from liberal forces within his own party and especially from the religious right. His administration incurred the wrath of evangelicals, a new movement in American politics, in 1978 when the IRS established new rules revoking the tax-exempt uh, tax status of racially segregated private Christian schools. Republican activists described the IRS controversy as the spark that ignited the relig religious rights involvement in, in politics. While the IRS controversy flared, economic crises in the U.S. multiplied. Unemployment reached 7.8% in May of 1980, up from 6% in the start of uh, Carter's first term. Uh, inflation, the rate at which the cost of goods and services increases every year, jumped from 6% in 1978 to a staggering 20% per year by the end of the winter of 1980. In another bad omen, the iconic Chrysler Corporation appeared close to bankruptcy during Carter's term. The administration responded to these challenges in fundamentally conservative and traditional ways with tax cuts, deregulation, and attempts to balance the federal budget, much to the dis uh, dismay of Democratic liberals who would have preferred to use deficit spending to finance a new New Deal. Finally, in a bid to halt inflation brought about in part by that Nixon shock, Carter's appointment of, uh, of the chair of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker, uh, raised interest rates, uh, the Federal Reserve interest rate, and tightened the money supply, policies designed to reduce inflation in the long run, but which increased unemployment and economic pain in the short run. Another energy crisis witnessed the spike, uh, spike in oil prices and oil shortages across the country, uh, and it brought out the Southern Baptist moralist in Carter. Famously, on July 15, 1979, the president, Jimmy Carter, delivered a nationally televised speech on energy policy in which he attributed the country's economic woes to a crisis of confidence. Carter lamented that too many of us now worship self-indulgence and consumption. The country initially responded favorably to the push for energy conservation, yet Carter's emphasis on discipline and sacrifice in his spiritual diagnosis for ec America's economic hardships sidestepped deeper questions of large-scale economic change and downplayed the harsh toll inflation had taken on ordinary Americans. In the end, Jimmy Carter's time on the national stage was plagued by economic inflation and a crisis, of, a crisis of confidence that struck at the very heart and soul of our national will. Carter used the power of the presidency to push a foreign policy based on the defense of basic human rights, which he continued when he was uh, no longer president. But the 1979 hostage crisis in Tehran coupled with a Soviet invasion of Afghanistan that same year, weakened Carter and opened the door for a new political movement in American political life. Propelled by the explosive population growth in the nation's previously mentioned Sun Belt, the Sagebrush Rebellion mobilized conservative opposition to environmental laws and restrictions on Western land development. Suburbanization also fueled the rise of the right, but nothing propelled the new breed of conservative politics like the powerful religious revivalism of evangelical Christianity. By the late 1970s, more than 70 million Americans were describing themselves as born-again Christians. Alarmed by what they considered the spread of immorality and disorder in American life, they were concerned about the way a secular culture was intruding into their schools, the communities, uh, and into their families. They worried feminism threatened the traditional family. They lost the right to say a prayer in public schools. They were alarmed by the Roe versus Wade decision. Inspired by religious leaders like Billy Graham, Jerry Falwell, Pat Robert, uh, Robertson, this Christian right became a powerful political force in the 1970s. They opposed federal interference in local affairs, they defended unrestricted free enterprise, and they denounced abortion, divorce, and homosexuality. 
Some denied the scientific doctrine of evolution and joined, uh, were joined by a segment of America's Catholic population. And they went about instituting a new era in which Christian values would once again dominate American life. 